the best of the Paul Feinbaum Podcast. We're joined by Andy Katz on a very big basketball day where Kentucky goes to Tennessee. And, Andy, in my time, that was uh, maybe the biggest one of the biggest games of the year. Tonight it's just another game for the Wildcats on the road to perfection. Yeah, I, I'll be shocked if they were to drop this one. Um, a guess you have coming up, that's the one that I think potentially yeah. they could lose. Uh, but uh, Kentucky right now is playing at a higher clip than Tennessee. I don't think Tennessee has the bigs in any fashion to contend with the Wildcats. And uh, we saw what happens when you don't have the personnel inside against South Carolina. No doubt. And I think uh, we're ready to be joined by our special guest. And uh, Andy knows this man well, and we all know him well, Mike Anderson, the uh, head coach of Arkansas. And uh, Coach Anderson, uh, we had a couple of uh, Arkansas fans calling in yesterday talking some serious smack. I'm sure you'd rather not listen to this. Uh, (laughs) uh, They cannot wait for Kentucky. I guess when you've beaten Kentucky uh, three straight times, uh, it's hard to believe anyone has done that in recent years. uh, But uh, you can talk a little smack. But games before that, first of all, thanks for being with us. Well, uh, thanks, Paul, and uh, thanks for having me on. And, and as you alluded to, we got quite a few more games before we play Kentucky. So our, our biggest concern right now is the Missouri Tigers coming in here tomorrow night. Yeah, and uh, that's a program you know pretty well since uh, you were at Missouri before heading uh, uh, to uh, Fayetteville, and I'm sure uh, fans have reminded you of that many, many times. But but enough of that. Last year you were in a, in a position that in uh, you, you owned February. Unfortunately, you just didn't own March. Uh, is that part of the message this year to the team? Hey, listen, we beat Kentucky twice last year, but we didn't win the other games? Well, it, to me, more importantly, just stay focused on the next task at hand, the things we can control, <clears throat> which will be the next game. And uh, we were a few plays away last year from having a, a real special year, and uh, we don't want to duplicate that this year. So let's stay into the now, and, and, and let's just get better. Uh, I, just, I like our team right now. I like how they're playing. Mike, we discussed this earlier on my show, Cat's Corner on ESPNU, and I'm always curious uh, why your style of play initially was, it seemed more conducive to Bud Walton rather than on the road, and how you were able to sort of solve that and make it a little bit more equitable, equitable that when you take that act on the road, it's similar to what people see in Bud Walton. Well, I'll I tell you, uh one of the things we did, we went and got some better players. You know, <laughs> uh, it helps when you got players, and I think you got to have players with that mentality that you have. You know, uh, you got to be mentally tough, you got to be physically tough, and uh, and you got to be able to make plays. And quite naturally, uh, we were close last year. We didn't make plays. Uh, it's a progression, you know, when you come in, and and you know, there's a reason why the job was open. Number one, so it takes time, it takes patience, it takes patience from a coaching standpoint. And I know the fans. Uh, you know, it's what, what have you done lately, but from a coaching standpoint, uh, uh, the blueprint I use is what we use at Missouri, we use at UAB, and we use at Arkansas. And so and now I think we're starting to see some of the results of that. In a matchup against Kentucky, and I know you got games before that, but just on paper, how does this Arkansas team match up against the size and length of Kentucky? I, from a size standpoint, we don't. I mean, when you look at, you know, I think they got three or four seven-footers. Uh, uh, man, I, I, they're, they're, they're a great team, great basketball team. They have guard players. You got the Harrison twins. Uh, you got the Eunice kid. I think he's a big time uh, player for them. And of course, Devin Booker, a guy that can knock shots down. And, and you're talking about they lost one of their better players when Porter's. He's not even there. So, uh, but when you look at Colley Stein, uh, he's got two years of playing major college basketball, and it just seems like he's all over the place. And their defense. Uh, I mean, you got outrun them, so that's. I guess that's one way you have to do it. You got outrun them, I guess. Coach, I know uh, the rest of the league, the other 13 coaches, including you, are, are, as well as the rest of college basketball, are getting tired of being asked about Kentucky. But you, you've been part of some great programs: uh, national championship teams, Final Four teams, teams that have made great runs in March. Uh, how good is this Kentucky team in terms of history? Well, it's a real, real good basketball team, but you got to remember. I, the first team I played, uh, you know, with Anthony Davis, I thought that was a great, great team. I mean, Anthony Davis, you had the team kid, uh, Gil Kreese. I thought that was a great, great team. And, uh, and I think this team here is, is probably just as good. Maybe not necessarily the seasoning. They're not, they don't have the seasoning that that team had. But from a talent standpoint, they're very, very talented. Mike, when you guys won it in 94 in Charlotte, uh, with uh, Nolan Richardson as the head coach. How did that team deal with the expectations 
of winning a national championship? Well, they've seen everything through Coach Richardson's eyes. I, I, I really, really believe that. You know, each and every game was a was a challenge, and uh, we stayed into the to the now, and that's the same formula that I try to use. Let, let's control our own destiny. How do you do that? Uh, you control each game in front of you, and and we had some great leaders in, in, on that basketball team. You had Corey Beck, you had Dwight Stewart, and you had some great players, and uh, Scotty Thurman, who was ahead of his time, along with a great player by the name of. Corliss Nasty Williams. By the way, we actually are going to hang his banner, hang his jersey up uh, tomorrow night. Uh, what, what a great, great player uh, from the state of Arkansas that we're going to honor him uh, tomorrow night. All right, Mike, this is the Paul Feinbaum Show. <laughs> What's a better atmosphere, a basketball game against Kentucky at, at Bud Walton or a football game in Fayetteville against, who should I say? Who, who would you say? Alabama. Alabama. What's a better atmosphere? Uh, Bud Walton Arena, I mean, you're talking about <laughs> Kentucky basketball. I mean, can you imagine, you know, back when I was here with Coach Richardson, it was the prelude to the Super Bowl. And I think just a minute people watched the Arkansas-Kentucky game, then they watched the Super Bowl, and we had some unbelievable games with uh, against uh, Coach Rick Pitino. And you grew up in Alabama, Coach. I mean, you're, you're never going back there again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I tell you what, basketball has always been a something that uh, I've had a passion about. Even growing up in the uh, great state of Alabama, football uh, crazy state, uh, but basketball is something that's always dear to my heart. Well, no doubt, Coach. Always, always good to visit. Best wishes, and uh, we'll try to. Calm, while you're, are you're coaching tomorrow night, we'll try to calm your fans down and, and let them know Missouri is in town as opposed to that Kentucky game in two weeks. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. You bet. It's always good to see you, Coach Anderson. Mike Anderson, uh, what a great coach, and uh, tutored under Nolan Richardson. And uh, he's, do you think he has finally uh, turned that corner there, and they're ready to roll? Well, let's. Yes, but let's see what happens, as you pointed out, in March, because they have been a very good February team. Uh, I do think, though, that this season, if, big if, if Kentucky is going to lose one game in the regular season, I think it's against Arkansas at home. Um, but that's a big if. Got to see how both teams are playing at that juncture. Uh, I am curious, though. I mean, we've talked at length on this program about Kentucky's fan base and the interest in the sport. Uh, obviously, it's at the top. Um, Arkansas basketball. Oh. I mean, you saw it in the 90s. What did that do for the SEC? What, what can that do for the SEC if it returns to the way it was? Yeah, I, I think it can take, take the replace of Missouri, which we all thought was going to be the rabid fan base. And I, and I, I always try to tell people, you don't understand how, how big basketball is in Missouri. And I think a lot of us, Andy, have forgotten how big it was in Arkansas. I mean, there was nothing like it. Uh, particularly, I remember a game in 94, uh, Arkansas came into uh, Coleman Coliseum, number one in the country, and Alabama beat them that day. And uh, never forget, uh, forget the, the president making a comment after the game that he, he, sta he, sta he sat and watched the entire game because Bill Clinton, as you know, you know a few presidents, um, he, was, he was one of the biggest Arkansas fans in the world. Speaking of that, uh, I want to, before you go, uh, you're pretty well known for the for the bracket uh, with uh, the president. Is that, uh, I don't want to have you disclose any NSA secret, but uh, are you getting ready for that? Uh, well, that's the plan. <laughs> I mean, what we, we don't like to promote it. Too much in advance just because, obviously, world events can change. Sure. Um, no, that nothing is, is getting in the way of the yeah, bracket that for is President still the Obama. Plan. Uh, two more years uh, before the next uh, president takes office, so uh, that's still the plan. I, I will say this. He has gone chalk at times. Uh, I would be shocked if he doesn't pick Kentucky. We'll have to wait and see. What is that like? I mean, I know you've done it a few times now, but uh, it's for, for the young guy who, who grew up eyes wide like everyone when it comes to the presidency. That has to be a pretty cool feeling. Yeah, look, it never gets old to go to the White House. I've been very fortunate <laughs> to go there, uh, I think, close to ten times. Um, the bracket, teams have come in, did two other interviews. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I, I'm a, I love history, so I love going into the couple rooms that we're allowed to go into, which we've done it in the library, we've done it in the map room. Um, you know, World War II map that was so crude when you look at it now with the advancing armies and all that. Uh, so I just, I love the the institution of the White House in terms of just the historical uh, building and all its nooks and crannies. Uh, I saw the president uh, gave an interview to a Raleigh radio station last week to talk about Dean Smith. I mean, I, I guess that confirms what we already know, that he really is passionate and understands the history of the game. Yes, and, and he did give Dean Smith the Presidential Medal of Freedom Award. 
uh, for his work, not just obviously in the game, but on social justice issues. Uh, Dean was not well enough to go. His wife uh, stood in his place. So I'm not surprised that he did give a comment uh, about his passing and then go on a, on a show uh, locally in North Carolina to discuss his impact, not just in the game, but also, um, you know, on the state of North Carolina in uh, segregation. And uh, later in life, uh, he was against the death penalty and was pretty outspoken about it. When you get there again, assuming everything works out, uh, let him know that there's college football played in this country, too. I well, mean, he was a big proponent of the, yeah, the playoff. Yeah, I know that. But you just don't get the feeling that he's he's mapping his Saturdays around. It looks like he's out playing golf on pretty October days as opposed to. Well, golf. next year we've got to get him to try to do a bracket uh, of the Final Four of college football. Put in a good word. Okay, I, mean, I will. I know we're just nobody's here, but uh, we try. <laughs> Andy, always great. All right, thanks, Paul. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Let's uh, continue. Uh, Lance in Tennessee. How are you, Lance? Oh, I was well, you said nothing compares to Kentucky, Paul. What are you talking about? Do you understand that since Coach K's been at Duke, they, they, they've owned Kentucky. I mean, they've won four national championships. Kentucky ain't done nothing. Well, I mean, uh, Lance, let me, let, me, let, me, let me clarify. I'm not talking about national championships. I'm talking about a culture of fans. Uh, and I will say it again. Uh, I've lived in Alabama. I've lived in Tennessee. I've lived in North Carolina. I've lived in Louisiana. I've never seen anything like the culture of Kentucky basketball fans. At one time, North Carolina was close. It's not, it's not anywhere close anymore. Okay, but check this out. If you, if you look at the end game, uh, as far as home field, I'm giving Kane and Crazy a bigger edge over Kentucky fans in a heartbeat. But if we just want to talk about people you're not, But you don't understand what, Lance, you're, you're missing the point. Duke, Duke, the Duke fan base is very small. It's a national brand. But you can walk down the street of uh, any city in North Carolina, and you're going to see 10 to 1 uh, Tar Heel Blue over Duke. Duke is just not that big a deal uh, in the in the state that it, it resides in. It's a huge deal nationally. I mean, Duke and Syracuse, Duke and anyone, uh, Duke and North Carolina tomorrow night. So it's it's it, I mean, everyone watches that game. But you, I'm talking about driving down the street, whether you're in Eastern Kentucky, Western Kentucky, the coal mines, Louisville, up. Up near the Cincinnati border, uh, down uh, toward Nashville, it doesn't make any difference. It's all about Kentucky basketball. Hey, by the way, Cameron holds 9,000 and, and Ruff holds 23,000. Well, it's, 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 I mean, the size of the arena is, is, I mean, is irrelevant compared to the, the interest. I mean, Duke's not even the biggest story in its own zip code. I didn't want to argue the fans. I just want to argue the program. And I think Duke's been a program in the last 25 years that Kentucky's been. I mean, that's all. It's called Cal. He's a choke horse. He's underachieved at Memphis. He underachieved last year. I mean, you can't be the best coach when you lose to a first-year coach that Connecticut had last year. I mean, it, well, first I, of all, you're, yeah, let me let me say something, Lance. Number one, you're you're really biased. Um, you're uh, and you're also talking about Duke, who, who I believe last year lost in the first round of the NCAA basketball tournament. Well, listen, I mean, if you ask me, would I take uh, Mike Krzyzewski to be my coach over Calipari? Uh, Krzyzewski is one of the greatest coaches of all time. Cal has not proven himself on that level yet. He may. Uh, I mean, I, I thought what he did last year, you know, beginning number one, uh, getting, I mean, he was out of the tournament at one point in February. He got back to the final game, nearly won the whole championship. Mike Krzyzewski has had a couple of choke jobs himself. Uh, he actually has had quite a few in recent years. I agree. But if Coach, if Coach Cal would have won half of his national championships he's been in, he would all be, really be considered a great coach. And I heard somebody say Pat Summers, the greatest coach in college basketball history. You can't go 0 and 4 against GR Yama and be the greatest college basketball coach in college basketball history. Well, first of all, so first of all, first of all, first of all, Lance, she didn't go 0 and 4. They they played many many times, and and she beat him. Uh, she didn't beat him uh, as much as he beat her. But I, I think what she did and what she stood for, I'll, I'll, I'll take my chances with Pat Summit over Gino. She's all in four national championships against Gino. He took Tennessee out after 97. She got lucky with Taylor Sparks. I'm talking about in head to head competition. I, I didn't realize you were talking about national champion. But by the way, you, you, listen. Uh, he lost this nine wins. She got uh, a good record against you, Tom Paul. Well, uh, I'll say it again. I'll take someone who is revered and respected and universally liked by everyone who ever met her versus someone who has won championships. So I'll leave it at that. I'm saying this. 
but she's 0-4 in national championship I, I'm, games. I'm well aware of that, okay? Well, you can't be the greatest coach if you're 0-4 against somebody in national championship games. Oh, that's ridiculous. You, well, Angie, that you, are, you, are, you are really a hater, aren't you, man? What, 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 how, do you what? say, how do you say that in football? If you say in the last 0 4 to I would mind a national championship. You wouldn't say it's the greatest coach of all time, but you're saying basketball? I'm sorry, she's sick. Okay, uh, well, listen, uh, you're, you're welcome. Yeah. Lance, this is what's called a disagreement, okay? We're not going to go outside with uh, switchblades. Uh, so, I mean, that's your opinion? That's my opinion, okay? Uh, I'll leave it at I'll that. I mean, every, I mean, everything with you, Lance, is fight to the death. I mean, we, we could have a conversation. We're talking about sports here. We're not talking about uh, world peace. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Gabe Wright knows a little bit about uh, the drill. Uh, the former uh, Auburn offensive lineman, uh, excuse me, the former Auburn defensive lineman. I was thinking of Barrett saying offensive lineman. Uh, Gabe Wright joins us uh, to talk about uh, the combine, what to expect, and uh, as well as his career at Auburn. Uh, Gabe, thanks for the time. Uh, appreciate uh, you being on. And uh, what have you been doing to get ready for uh, this all important week? Uh, simply put, uh, I've been I've been in a steady hand of grinding, man. Ever since the bowl game's been over with, I've uh, I took a flight to Phoenix, Arizona, and I've been training with the EXO staff. And uh, they've been doing a real good job preparing me for uh, this week. We talked uh, we've talked to various people about what to expect uh, and uh, you know they, they talk about uh, obviously being paraded around I'm sure that's not anything that you're concerned about but uh, what about the uh, the uh, the common sense side the mental aspect uh, the, how do you prepare yourself for all the questions uh, whether they're trick or not uh, all the different psychological drills that you you will be put through I must say uh, the senior bowl uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I really prepared myself, you know, for for a more a more in depth look at what you know some of these meetings will will consist of. That that being head coaches, you know, general managers, you know, not just area scouts, which which we've talked to, you know, over over the course of uh, you know the senior year somewhat. Um, so the senior bowl really gave me my first look in depth look at you know just how the operations. You know how the media and how the scouts kind of sit around, and you don't want to ask you questions. So I feel like I'm pretty, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty well, you know, in that regard. But uh, only thing I can do is just ask people, you know, who who've been there in previous years. But I also hear that it changes from year to year. In terms of what you've been told, Gabe, I mean, everyone has a different opinion. Uh, do you have a vague idea of? Of, of of where you are in the draft right now, I assume by now you have at least uh, some idea. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've heard any, I've heard anywhere from second to fourth, and um, you know that doesn't bother me any. You know, uh, the fact is, you know, it, it's the reason why I went to the Senior Bowl. It's the reason why I'm at the Combine, and that's just you know to make, to improve myself. And uh, you know, if if the scouts and the teams can get a glimpse of that, then you know, of course, then that would already upgrade itself but uh, you know that's that's my main concern is just trying to be the best that I can be right now and these next couple of months is going to be really important in doing so yeah and, and listen no, no doubt you'll be ready uh, from a physical standpoint and uh, I would think uh, you have to be pretty fired up knowing what you did uh, in Mobile and, and what you can do now to improve your stock uh, I, I guess that's the only way you can think isn't it absolutely absolutely you gotta you gotta really take this thing one day at a time you know, you can you can get caught up in, you know, I'm at I'm at Exos with 30 other guys training for the same goal as me. So you know, you can get caught up in you know you know the Twitter sphere and, and the Google this and you know, what round that. But uh, you know, it's an, it's really important to stay hungry and, and to really be humble through this process. And and that's and that's my whole goal is uh, you know keeping a one day at a, one day at a time mindset. I, I know that's I know that's kind of cliche, but it's really it's really important in these next couple months. As soon as the ball game is over, you got to transition. And lose the whole college mindset, and you got to start understanding, you know, just just how to be a pro. And, and it's really not easy, you know. I say that to say, you know, I, I've had my days where, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, uh, you know, weary. You know, you know, what's next? You know, I got mobile, then I got to go to Indiana. You know, then I got pro day. So you got to take it one day at a time, and just keep that maintain aspect of just trying to improve yourself, improve your stock. Uh, I'm not sure if it's hit you yet. I'm uh, playing your final bowl game, uh, walking off the field. Uh, at Jordan Hare for the last time. I know the focus has changed, but as you uh, 
have spare moments on plane rides or uh, exercising or doing whatever you, you do to work out and to get ready for all this. What do you think, now, realizing now that uh, this part of your life is over? I'll tell you what, man. It's, it's, it's one thing to think about your lifelong dream, you know, and, and think about the draft coming up in a couple – in a couple months, but it's also another thing, you know, to see with guys and talk about your college career, you know, talk about stats, talk about wins and losses. Uh, and, you know, of course, it being my last year, this was a this was a tough year for us. Uh, you know, of course, like any, any player can say, you know, we didn't finish how we would have liked, but uh, I can say for, you know, uh, I couldn't I couldn't say I played with a, a, a tight-knit group of guys, especially the senior class, us being 25. Strong, uh, you know, each and every one of us having that one common goal, you know, to try to be leaders and bring the team together. And in doing so, I'm I'm happy with that. I know we didn't end the bowl game how we would have liked, but I'm happy to know that everybody gave their own, everybody fought for the same bond. When you think about it, Gabe, uh, you know, it will be remembered uh, with five losses, but at one point I believe Auburn was number two in the country. They were really in a great spot. Uh, I'm not making excuses for your team, but uh, I've never seen a tougher schedule in my life. Yeah, you know, every every once in a while, because Mazon might have might have mentioned it, but he made it uh he made it also that you know that we never used that as a crutch. You know, we I mean last year our schedule could have been tough as well, you know, and, and we still find a way, uh, you know, close or not, you know, we still find a way. And, and this year, yes, it was. It was, you know, written down as one of the toughest schedules, but um, you know, it is what it is. When you're playing the SEC period, you know, you got week in, week out games and. And even even out of conference games, that can be a you know a tough pass. And uh, you know we just didn't get it done for the most part. Not that uh, it hasn't been talked about enough, and documentaries have been done. But going back to last season, uh, being on the field, being part of that, uh, at times uh, when you consider the end of the the Georgia game, the Alabama game, even uh, the run against Florida State, uh, you have uh, stories to tell your grandchildren many years from now. Uh, what was that like to experience? Man, I, I tell you what, you know, you see, you see the clips, you know, ball over the top, and uh, you know, with with Cal, you know, with the band on the field and such, and just to think that I was on the field at that moment, ten years from now, twenty years from now, you know, when they show replays or when they even talk about it, I can I can show my son or talk to my, you know, talk to my kids or my nieces and nephews and just really give them a, um, you know, a first person look into what went on, you know what I mean? And, being a kid that grew up watching ESPN and watched some of these very so prestige games, you know, I can I can say, man, it's it's truly a dream, you know, to to look at it and then be able to be in one of the most historic plays ever in college football. And uh, like I say, it's a it's a blessing, man. It's, it really is, and it, it's something I I'll never forget, and I for, I'll forever look back on. I mean, I know uh, the Georgia game was was miraculous, and and you probably thought. Walking off the field that day uh, with the prayer of Jordan here that it would never get any better. <laughs> but uh, take <laughs> us take us through the final uh, couple of moments or minutes, I should say, of the, of the Alabama game. Uh, I mean, it was such a utterly bizarre game when when Auburn looked like it was done on that fourth down play and nothing uh, and it didn't it didn't work and then uh, everything seemed to go Auburn's way after that. I tell you what, man. Last last year, of course, my zone always made the. He always emphasized that if it comes down to the end, that we'll find a way to win. You know, if it's close at the end, then we'll find a way to win. And I can believe all 70 or 80 guys believe in that statement, uh, full heartedly, full fact. Um, you know, it came down to the last kick, and um, I believe we called a timeout. And um, we still didn't – I still to this day did not know that Chris Davis was back there. You know, this is nothing <laughs> we practice. This is nothing we practice or play. You know, he didn't say, guys, block for me. Um, I, see, I see the ball kick. And um, I turned around and I actually, I actually thought it was going in. Then I heard, you know, I heard the crowd roar, um, and Chris Davis caught the ball. I started returning, so I, I knew I had to, you know, get back into playing football and you know find the an angle. And turns out I made one of the key blocks, just, just, just as much so as my teammates. And uh, it just, it's a true tribute to just say, you know, the players really loved each other. You know, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't planned from a D-line standpoint. I know Coach G didn't tell us, you know, be ready for it to be caught and start blocking. We just knew what to do. And, uh, you know, that's a testament to our coaches um, all year staying on us. When somebody catches an interception, then you got to catch an angle. 
catch an angle on the uh, on the offensive players. You hear a lot of uh, Alabama fans uh, talk about uh, had that play not happened as if the game was was still going to be won by the Tide. I mean, it is worth remembering the game was tied. Do you, do you have any doubt with the way the that Big Mo was shifting toward Auburn that Auburn would have won that game in overtime? Absolutely, Paul. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I just know when the clock did hit zero, Auburn won that game, and that's that's really all that matters to me. I can't tell you, <laughs> you know, I can't I can't speak on the what ifs, and uh, you know, but uh, I just know when that clock hit zero, who was on top. Yeah, there, we don't need to do the what if game uh, the way it ended, but I, but I've always uh, I've always felt like like you did there, Gabe, that it, it really didn't make any difference whether that whether, whether Chris ran it back or not. The Alabama's last chance to win that game uh, had expired. Absolutely. Absolutely. When those when those four zeros went up, it was over, Paul. <laughs> well, you can't change it now. Uh, Gabe, listen, uh, best wishes uh, with the combine. We'll be pulling for you, and it was fun to catch up. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Let's uh, check in with John, who is in Birmingham. Hey, John. Hey, Paul. How are you doing today? Really well. Thank you. Great. I just had a couple of comments that uh, I – Sometimes I just shake my head at some of the callers, and particularly, you know, Lance, when he was calling in, and somebody asked, posed the question to you of, you know, who's got the more passionate, rabid fan base, you know, between Alabama and Kentucky, and all of a sudden, you know, it turned into, you know, is Pat Summer a better coach, or Gino a better coach, or um, North Carolina or Duke and all that, and it's just, you know, the point of, the, you know, was just your opinion on the, the rabidness or passionate of, of fan base. And it just, you know, just makes me laugh at times that some people are just calling just to argue, even though I had no point in, in the conversation that uh, somebody opposed to you. And then the other point that I wanted to um, mention was um, Coach Pearl. Um, I have a daughter who's a freshman down at Auburn, and he sent out a note today to uh, all the students, uh, an open letter, so to speak, you know, thanking them for coming to the games and how much it means to them that they're an undersized outman team right now but they're building something and how you know it, it's so important it is to have the home court advantage if you will and uh he was thanking them for that and you know he pointed out to the georgia win and then he was encouraging people to get there early tonight that the gates were going to open up at 6 30 and rumor has it that there's going to be pizza waiting for folks that <laughs> they're waiting in line so i mean I, I guess kudos go to uh coach pearl and you know really embracing the whole family atmosphere down in Auburn. You know, I, I don't have a dog in the hunt outside of paying tuition at Auburn, but I just think he, he's going about the right way, and he's, you know, taking full advantage of the second chance, so to speak, that he's been given. And hopefully, you know, he'll, he'll stick around there for, for many years to come. But, you know, he's a great marketer, and I think there's a lot of excitement down on the plains, particularly about the basketball, let alone the football going on there. Well, that that's what he's all about, and, and that's the difference. Uh, you, you hear a lot of criticism of, of other programs, most notably Alabama. And to me, Bruce is what college basketball should be about. It should be embracing the students. He's done it as well or better than anyone I've ever seen. And uh, when, I mean, again, it's cold. It's late starting time, 8 o'clock tonight, uh, central time. And to me, if you're a student, you want to please the head coach, and that's what he's doing. And that's he did that at Tennessee. And by the way, he's not the only one. Uh, he's just done it uh, better and with more attention than anyone in recent time. Thank you for the call, though. Really do appreciate that. Ed is next up in Connecticut. Uh, Ed, thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, Paul. Um, thank you once again for taking my call. Sure. Uh, you and I have spoken before. Usually it's about Georgia football. <laughs> That's true. But please uh, allow me up here in Connecticut to say what I want to say. I, um, by the way, Niantic, Connecticut, is right next door to the last fellow who just called you from Waterford, Connecticut. Okay. <laughs> if I go over the line, we could be neighbors for all I know. I'm becoming, um, uh, I've been to Connecticut, I've been to Connecticut a number of times. That's where, uh, that's where our paycheck comes from. So we like right. Connecticut. Okay. Um, I have two things that I really want to get out. One is Kentucky basketball. Now, up here in Connecticut, we are college basketball fans. We are fortunate to have two programs, the men's and the women's, that are excellent. 
Um, so we're a bit spoiled. As far as Kentucky is concerned, and you being a big football fan, can understand what I'm saying when it comes to football. Usually when you see a team, you see one or two players that have pro aspects, and the rest, especially in football, are just breaking their backs and killing themselves just for the glory of playing college football or basketball. Kentucky, to me, is just what Talent Perry is doing, and he does it well, is ruining the sport. He's taking the fun out of it. Okay, we had a lot of fun winning a national championship last year. <clears throat> the reason was, number one, we beat Kentucky. But number two, we knew these players. Shabazz Napier, we had seen him from his freshman year on and learned how to grow with him. You know, by the time they became seniors, we knew these kids and could really glory in their victory. These kids from Kentucky are there for one reason and one reason over. Uh, you know, if from the 1 to 12. Well, and, let me, and let me allow you one a question, though. Um, all these great players at Kentucky, if, if they hadn't gone to Kentucky, would it change the outcome of their careers? Had they gone to Duke or North Carolina or Connecticut or Syracuse or Michigan or Ohio State, would they still be leaving early? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm sure they would. Now, by the way, I, I agree with you. I, I, we've had a few. We've had you've a few identified the, the, the problem that a lot of people have watching college basketball right now. It's not what it used to be. Um, is it better than it was? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, the argument about the one and done versus uh, what we had in the past 15 years ago when players were going straight to the NBA and, and many are, I mean, I'm not talking about Kobe Bryant. And LeBron, I'm talking about the ones that, that never got drafted. I mean, those are the stories that broke my heart. Um, right. But, yeah, he's just – he's taking advantage of the system. Uh, and for that, what, what can you say other than congratulations? Uh, you know, is it – I mean, Mike Krzyzewski's lost a player or two early uh, that you wouldn't have expected. It happened last year. It's, it's, it's going to happen every year now. And, and I don't – I mean, he's just done it better than anyone else. But, but, yeah, was it cool to see UConn do what it did last year? You better believe it. Well, uh, here's another problem, though. You have these kids coming up with one and done. They're kids. And it's being shown in the NBA now that these kids are not physically no. old enough to play an 82-game schedule. And a lot of them are breaking down from non-contact injuries. Whereas I feel if they've been allowed to or encouraged to stay in school and grow like a kid should grow, I'm not talking about LeBron. LeBron was a man before when he was 15. Oh, sure. I mean, there's they're, they're a different story. But you know and I know that a lot of these kids are breaking down early in the pros. And I think the reason for that is these kids are not ready for that grind physically. And uh, I think a 23-year-old is much more ready to play than a 19-year-old. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I feel that's... No, I, I don't think you are. Um, but but I, I would respond to this, and, and listen, I'm, you know, this is what we're all about here. But you, you said you, you feel like Calipari is destroying college basketball, correct? The interest in it, yeah. Yeah, because other schools, other coaches are doing it. I think the whole one-and-done system is destroying college basketball. Yeah, maybe, listen, maybe I would only say this about, about John Calipari. I, I don't know if it's his – but it's not his fault. Uh, he has just done what, what all right. smart people do, and uh, they, 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 they try to find an edge uh, any way you can, they, they can. I mean, Nick Saban has done it in college football. Others have mm -hmm. caught up. Uh, Urban Meyer is doing it. Uh, you, you, you just – everyone – if everyone goes the same speed, which, the legal speed, you have to find a way to uh, – Get on the inside. It's, it's, I'm not trying to talk NASCAR to you because it's not—it's not my sport. But but everyone, you, you have a limit. It's it's those who have learned how to cheat on uh, cheat legally in NASCAR legally. are the winners. Right. Um, Talent Perry was a winner before they weren't done. Sure. Back in Massachusetts and you know where he coached before and everything. Calipari Cal had, was a winner Cal had an amazing run in Memphis. People forget right. about that now. Right. Uh, I mean, he, he he had a special thing, and I remember he he almost didn't take the UK, the UK job because 
he was the mayor of Memphis, and that was a basketball mm -hmm. town, and he nearly won the national championship and uh, was determined and would have won it again or would have gotten back there again. Uh, but you know, it, it's hard to turn down Kentucky. Yeah, I understand that. And then one more thing, just to finish what the other fellow from Waterford was trying to, I think, saying. I don't understand. Here in Connecticut, I mean, I'm talking for years. I'm 76 years old. I have followed Gino's career from the beginning. Um, Gino Ariama has built what we always talk about dynasties. He has built a true dynasty. And the reason that he's been so successful, why people, I don't know why people don't like him. You know, you say you like him or not. I have all the respect in the world. I'm heartbroken about that summit. You have to be. I mean, to hear that, you know, a woman like her all of a sudden has dementia and this and that. I mean, I always thought Pat was the one woman who could coach men's basketball. But here in Connecticut, when the kids come here, the girls especially, they know that they are going to be recognized throughout the state as heroes. They can't walk into malls. They can't walk into, you know, places where they are not accepted as big as the men. And um, I think that's Gino's success, the fact that he can convince these kids to come here, the fact that he's a great coach, but he has the advantage of coaching in a state where women's basketball has been accepted almost to the point of the men's. And, um, well, Ed, let me, let me close by saying one thing. I, I don't know Gino. Um, maybe if I knew him, I would have a different opinion. And this is not a Tennessee bias or an SEC bias. Uh, right. I, I know. So I say that in full disclosure. Um, I know he does it right. Uh, I know what he stands for. And, and I know the pride that the people of Connecticut uh, have and take in that program. I do appreciate your call. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Very thoughtful conversation there from Ed in Connecticut about uh, the state of college basketball and the place that Kentucky has. And, and I don't know if he was being personal toward Calipari or just using John Calipari as the face of what he doesn't like in relation to the way the, in, the, way the game is played and, and the way the sport is displayed. Let's get a response to that from Michael, who is in Lexington. Michael, good afternoon. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? Very well. Thank you very much. It just seems like in my opinion, that Ed was kind of being a little ignorant toward Kentucky basketball and the one-and-done theory. It, it, it really seems to me like he was saying that these players will come and leave and then get their money and go with their careers and not really come back and care about their college or their alma mater. And he was saying how UConn last year, he was able to maybe – see these players as their players and would think of them as their players that they could resemble or may, that they could root for. But it seems like he doesn't realize that Kentucky in general, that they're able to bring these players back and they still care about Kentucky. I mean, you look at it and Anthony Davis has come back for weeks on any trains with Kentucky in the summer. Kid Gilchrist comes back. Randall was back this weekend, and they're walking around taking pictures with kids, and it doesn't really seem like this whole idea of they're, them just taking their money and running is really all that true. Well, you know, that's an interesting thought there, um, Michael, because there is that feeling, uh, and I've, I've always been surprised because I've been wrong about a number of players uh, where, where I've said uh, they'll never come back, uh, any sport for that matter, and they do. Uh, I remember uh, when Cam Newton uh, went to Auburn playing football for one year. It was his third school. Uh, a lot of us said, he doesn't care about Auburn. He'll never be back. Well, <laughs> he's back all the time. He's trying to get a degree. And I, I think uh, there, there's, there's something that you can't tell from the upper deck or the press box or from 38,000 feet, and uh, you've done a really nice job of explaining it. At the end of the day, Kentucky is on that jersey, and Kentucky means a great deal. Exactly. That's, I think that's a good point about it. I mean, they come back, and truth, like I, I've been going to U.K. games for 15 years. We have season tickets, and we go to all these games, and after the game, they'll have a post-game show that the local radio will run. 
and you, all these players will come out and talk to the radio, sign autographs with kids, take pictures, and then they'll come back later in a few years, and they'll still do it like they never left. Well, no matter, what, like, no matter what you do, if you play college basketball or college football or college baseball or any, any sport, that's who you are the rest of the way. I mean, I run into players all the time. Uh, you know, some of whom I know, some I've never really even heard of, and they'll walk up to me in an airport and say, hey, yeah, I played at Vanderbilt in 88. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's part of it. doesn't matter how long you played there. It doesn't matter whether you have a degree or you, uh, you know, were on the dean's list. Uh, it's just part of your, your past, and, and it's, it, it's, it's the universal language in sports. It's where, yeah, did, you, okay. where did you play ball? Me? No, no, I mean, I mean that, I mean, oh. where, you know, where, where LeBron James doesn't, I mean, he has a high school, pretty famous high school, by the way. Um, yeah. And he almost had a college. Um, and so did Kobe Bryant. So did all these guys. But, uh, you know, that, that, but that, that's, 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 that doesn't matter with them. But if you're just a, uh, even if you're a good player or a great player, uh, short of being one of the all-time superstars, I mean, Charles Barkley, I've, I've never seen an interview yet. Or somebody didn't say, what was it like when you were at Auburn, when he was referred to as the round mound of, of rebound? And I'll never forget uh, the first time I covered uh, an Auburn game on the road with Charles Barkley. I've told the story before, Michael. Uh, we're in Houston. They're playing uh, Fly, uh, Fly Slamma Jamma there under Guy Lewis in the early 80s, one of the famous teams that never won the national championship, although I think they went to the, the uh, Final Four three consecutive years. And, and uh, about midnight, I'm in a Houston hotel. There's a knock on my door. It's a pizza guy, pizza delivery guy. Back then, I ate a little more pizza than I do now. And I, I mean, I, the only, only problem is back then I couldn't afford pizza uh, or a delivery guy because I was working for a newspaper that paid nothing and, and, and was uh, and, and, and he gave you about uh, 40 cents a day on the road. And I said, what? Uh, I said, I didn't order a pizza. Next thing you know, like three doors down, that was my pizza. It, it, was, it was Barkley. I said, okay. <laughs> he didn't offer me any either. So uh, that was my, I mean, I knew who Barkley was, but uh, that was my introduction to Charles Barkley, the uh, round mound of rebound. And uh, pizzas were pretty much every night on the road for Barkley. They're still every night on the road for yeah. Barkley. <laughs> He's having, he just has better suits now to camouflage the fat. Let's uh, check in with you. <laughs> Gary is next up. How are you, Gary? Doing fine, Bob. Um, I want to talk with you, jump off on football just a minute because it's coming up in a few weeks. This proposed rule change of the lineman must stay within one yard and not three yards of the line of scrimmage. It's going to have something to do with play action pass game, in my opinion. But the thing I really want to discuss about that was uh, the evidence that I've heard of use, Tony Barnhart and other talking heads, is that uh, the play from year before last where Marshall rolls to his left. Uh, you know, and, and then pulled up at the last minute there and tossed it to coach. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the play, the rollout pass with a quarterback uh, reacting off of a defensive back over on the sideline has been a part of football ever since I can remember. Uh, now, that didn't have it. There's no lineman even in the picture. Uh, my point is they're using a play that as evidence that it needs to be changed that had nothing to do with Lineman being one or two yards or three yards off the ball. What do you think? Well, I, I mean, I, what I think, I haven't really thought about it. Um, uh, have, you, have you been thinking about this rule? I don't else? really think about offensive line rules uh, in no. the offseason well, that much. I, don't, I, I don't mean, it does make a difference. Do to the, to the uh, uh, play action pass game, you know, where you fake run to a pass, that's been a part of football for a long time. They put in an extra official to help watch it, but. It, I think it's uh, really to gear towards some of the hurry up stuff. Really, they may not use that, but uh, they are. I think that's really the motive. And uh, like I said, the play that they're talking about there as evidence had nothing to do with it. It was out on the corner. And, uh, well, what, what I like though is uh, Gary Tang. I went off a guy from Kentucky calling about uh, offensive line. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I usually am pretty uh, alert. I mean, I know what you're talking about, and I remember the play, but. Uh, coming up with an opinion on it is more difficult. Uh, I'm usually pretty opinionated on most things. Coming up next, illegal hands Ooh. downfield. We, we went through that last winter with uh, the hurry up oh, versus yeah. the, the uh, saving rule. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm still dizzy over that. Uh, Whitley is up next in Kentucky. Uh, good afternoon, Whitley. Hello. Hello. How are, you? How are you? Pretty well. I just wanted to say, you know, I'm very proud of Kentucky and the team and John Calipari as a coach. I think it's great that these kids are doing what they're doing, and even though some of them are getting drafted, you know, it's their choice to go. And, I mean, Calipari's an awesome coach, 
for what he's done in past seasons and what he's done this season. And just for kids today, you know, young people especially, I think it's great that they're out doing something and not, you know, laying around, especially in lower states like this, to be on welfare or drugs or anything like that. I think this is great what these kids are doing and what Calipari's doing for them. Well, I, I think it is, too. Um, I mean, listen, one thing about John Calipari, though, he... He 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 know he he does it right. Uh, he takes great pride in his players. Uh, we were talking to him about two weeks ago, and and uh, he talked about uh, the players that 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 have been on the USA team, the Olympic team. Uh, it's just not. I mean, I, I don't want to say it's a job. I mean, it, it's college. It's college basketball. Even for a very brief period of time, I think he does it the right way, and I think he has an impact on these players' lives. And you can sit there and laugh all you want. Uh, but that's who he is, and I think there, there's a reason why he is successful. And without that, uh, he, he wouldn't be where he is. He, it's just not cutthroat. It's not a business. He, he, yeah, it is a business in terms of winning. I realize this is the University of Kentucky, but he has. But there's a charisma about Cal. There's a there's a realness. There's a genuineness about him that I think a lot of people who don't know him, who aren't around him, don't see and comprehend. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. We're joined now by the one and only Dick Vitale, the legendary ESPN commentator. Uh, recently, uh, actually in November, his latest, It's Awesome Baby. I can't say it like Dick with uh, a bad throat. 75 years of memories and a lifetime of opinions on the game. All, all proceeds going to the V Foundation. And uh, for all the greatness of Dick Vitale, I think we overlook sometimes what he has given back uh, to so many wonderful charities. Uh, Dick Vitale, thank you very much for being with us. It's a, it's a great honor. Well, being with you, Paul. I've got to get you away from football, man. Get you talk some hoops. I'm under weather tonight, too, Paul. It's unbelievable. i got a miserable cold, head cold. But they said, Paul, find them. I said, I'm jumping on with my man. I'm jumping on because you're the only guy, only guy in TV and radio that I'm better looking at. Well, <laughs> I'm speechless, Dick. Um, the, the, the good news is, uh, with a bad with a bad throat, I'm going home in an hour and 15 minutes and watching you. You have to work all night. I know, but it'll be a lot of fun. I, I think, you know, it's, it's going to be tough here. Kentucky is so dominant, so big, so athletic. I think for a miracle to happen, Paul, uh, Tennessee's got to find a way magically to make at least 10 threes to be in a game, and that's easier said than done. But they did do it on five occasions this year in doing research for the game. There were five games where Tennessee made ten threes or more. And for it to happen tonight in terms of any kind of possible upset, that ball's got to – they got to rain threes tonight. they got to rain threes. Dick, you, you've seen it all. I mentioned the, the book, and uh, you've had a number of best-selling books. I mean, this reflects on your entire career. Uh, I, I'm sure it's always fun to reflect back, but how much fun was it to, to go back? Uh, set, well, not, I mean, you're 75 years old. You, I doubt you went back to your birth, although, although maybe you did. Well, you know, I, I talk about uh, many things that were very important to me growing up, you know, Paul. Any of us that have any kind of success, uh, whether it be as an athlete, whether it be as a broadcaster like you, myself, or anything that happens that's positive, there are a lot of people that made it happen. And I start off about my mom and dad. Uh, they were uneducated. My parents had a fifth-grade education, a doctor of love. And there was two things I share in the book that I heard every day of my life. Uh, I lost my eye as a kid, and I talk about that. And I went through a stage there where people would tease me all the time because my eye would drift on me. And I'd go home and I'd cry like a baby in my room because I pitched Little League and somebody would yell and say, hey, does that kid know where he's throwing a ball? Look at his eye. You don't know where he's seeing. And people don't know how much they hurt you. So I was talking about how that really, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was bullying. It was bullying. And there's no place for it, no place. But my mom would come in and my dad and say, Richie, don't listen to them. You could be somebody. They had a fifth-grade education, but they had a doctor to love. And there's two things I want to share with your listeners they taught me. One, never to believe in camp. And number two, I would hear every day, Paul, probably 10 to 15 times a day, Richie, be good to people, and people will be good to you. Amazing. And, and Dick, uh, I know your, your, your event every year in Florida last year, you honored a number of people, including Nick Saban. You raised uh, almost $13 million. Uh, I mean, that, that's an enormous amount of money for for one event. 
Well, you know, I'll tell you this. Uh, so far we raised 12.7 below, but it's not enough. If you look at the back of the book, uh, in the back of the book, I dedicate the book to 10 youngsters who over the years were with me at my gala or their parents. I got to know their families. Oh, and it's sad to say all 10 of them did not make it. Uh, they are right now up in heaven, and my goal is to raise as many dollars as I can to get research out there to help kids. There's nothing worse than seeing a young staff to do chemo, radiation, and all that stuff. It's just sad, really sad. I'll tell you this quick story, Paul. I've done a lot. I do loads of speaking, motivational all over the country, marketing groups, sales groups. I was asked to speak at a funeral for a little youngster, and Adrian Littlejohn, his name was. His dad played football at Mississippi State, coaches in my area as an assistant coach, and his son passed, and he asked me to speak at the funeral. It was the toughest speech I ever ever had to give him my life watching a mom and dad put their child to rest. So if anybody likes to help me, Paul, they can get an autographed copy of my book. Just go to dickvitalonline.com, and any dollar that I would make, any dollar I would make, goes to the Foundation for Pediatric Cancer. Dick, uh, I, I know uh, your voice is shaky. I don't, I don't want to push it, but uh, I do appreciate your time, and uh, I hope people will – We'll read that book and, 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 and contribute something because uh, you know, what you've done for not only the sport, for the network uh, that you've worked for uh, since almost its inception, uh, it, it, we, we can't fill in. We don't, we don't have enough time, but, but I, I want to thank you as someone I've known you since the very beginning, and uh, you've never changed. Well, Paul, thanks, buddy. I really appreciate it. I know you're doing a great, great job. Uh, you were right. We had Nick Saban. I'll tell this, and Nick will probably get embarrassed. He wrote me the most unbelievable letter. After the event, handwritten, he said, I've been a lot of events, Dickie B. I never was so touched. I'm going to tell you something else he did, Paul. I'll probably get embarrassed to said it. He gave me a check for $50,000 for the Big Foundation. Hmm. Listen, I uh, appreciate uh, your spending time with us. Uh, uh, be, be well tonight. We'll all be watching uh, Kentucky uh, at Tennessee with Dick Vitale uh, doing the, uh, the analyst uh, work. Uh, Dick, be well. T hope to see you soon. Thanks a lot, Paul. Great. We got you watching basketball. That is unbelievable. That's <laughs> awesome, baby. Thank you for listening to the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Tune into the Paul Feinbaum show every day from 3 to 7 Eastern on the SEC Network or on the ESPN radio app. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance.